look at the Word tonight. Uh, why don't you go ahead, if you, if you want, have your Bibles open. I'll have it up on the screen as well to Isaiah 53. But as you turn there, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for coming to be the servant of God, the one that was sacrificed for us, the one who suffered for us, the one who was our substitute for us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us remember this incredible cost that you paid so that, Lord, we would never take it for granted. The cross would not just be a decoration on the wall or around our neck, but, Lord, it would be a remembrance of the death and the suffering that you took in our place, what we should have deserved, what we did deserve, what we should have gotten, you received. So, Lord, thank you for stepping in our place. Help us remember tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus in your name. Amen. Amen. It was, of course, the darkest day in all history. Nothing could be worse, right? It led to the most glorious event that was ever imagined, but God the Son suffered and died. God the Son's body was laid in a tomb. If you think about bad things that can happen, there's nothing worse than the death of the creator of the universe. That is the ultimate But that's what happened, and it didn't occur by chaos. It didn't occur by chance. It was the purpose choice of God. It was the plan of God. The death of his son was necessary if the sin of humanity was to be rightfully judged. It's essential if the evil that was brought in by sin was to ever be made right. And, of course, the resurrection of his son is necessary if humanity is going to be offered eternal life, and we praise God for that. But the resurrection, that's what we celebrate on Sunday. On Friday, we remember what came first, because before there can be a resurrection, there has to be a death. There's not one without the other. In this case, of course, as Jesus is suffering a death on the cross, and as we do that, we're going to be looking at Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant, and um, we'll look at Isaiah chapter 53, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, which says, "'Who has believed our report?' And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Here we see the rejection of the servant. There's really four sections of this we can break it into. The rejection of the servant here. There's something so incredibly sobering about the rejection of Jesus Christ by the world because here he is, he's the Lord of all creation by whom everything, of course, was created. Through him, all creation maintains existence because we read in Colossians that in him all things consist. Colossians 1.17, the Son of God, of course, is utterly deserving of all praise, of all glory. That's, of course, what the angels had given to him before, long before even human time began. The angels were already giving him glory. That's what human beings, we will be giving him glory, of course, into all of eternity. Yet, when the Son of God appeared as a man, mankind, we rejected him. As it says here, we despised him. Jesus grew up as a Jew, a normal Jew among other Jews. He didn't appear to be a superman. He didn't come in all the glory of a king. He was born into poverty. He was born to a family that was tainted by scandal because of him. He didn't live in the cultural or religious center of the nation. He lived in the the backwater or the flyover country, so to speak, as we'd say today. So people were, of course, naturally skeptical of him when Jesus began his ministry. We think, well, at least that would all go away. That would change when Jesus revealed himself, right? No, wrong. Because even after Jesus demonstrated his power and his authority, he was still rejected by humanity, both Jew and Gentile alike. It didn't matter how many people he healed. It didn't matter how many miracles he performed or how much teaching he provided in which the people saw the authority of God that was invested in him. In the end, they still turned away from him. They, we, they should have esteemed him, but they rejected him. They cried out for his blood, demanding his death, and that's exactly what Pilate gave to them. Of course, that was the reason he came. Jesus deserves to be honored, 
but he bore dishonor in our place. That takes us to the next section, which is the substitution by the servant. Look at verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was bruised for our transgressions. He was, excuse me, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's a man of sorrows, and he carried our sorrows. The esteem that we should have given him in honor, we instead gave to him as being smitten by God. You know, the priests and others, they stood and they mocked Jesus on the cross, saying that he had saved others, but himself he cannot save, Luke 23, 35. They thought Jesus worthy of death because of the crime of blasphemy. Now, Jesus, of course, did die because of sin. He did die because of iniquity, but that sin and iniquity, that wasn't his own. It was ours. Jesus committed no blasphemy by making himself equal with God because he is God. Jesus did indeed save others. Jesus chose not to save himself. He chose to die an accursed death because we were the ones under the curse. It was for our transgressions that the whip fell upon his back. It was for our iniquities that the crown of thorns was shoved into his scalp. It was for our sins that he bore stripes and spikes and a spear in his side. We were the ones who had gone astray from the Lord God, not Jesus, but we were not the ones who bore the punishment we deserve for going astray. Instead, Jesus became our substitute, and he took the wrath of God for us. And we sing about it tonight. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was our substitute. He had no sin, but he became our sin. And our sin did receive his righteous punishment because it all fell upon Jesus. It just didn't fall upon us. And when that happened, he died, and that takes us to the next section, verses 7 through 9, the death of the servant. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Imagine for a moment what Jesus could have done. Jesus could have called down 12 legions of angels to defend him, of which God the Father would have gladly given him. He said as much in Matthew 26, 53. And if one angel was sufficient to destroy the firstborn children among the Egyptians in a single night, If one angel was enough to slaughter the Assyrian army of 185,000 soldiers outside of Jerusalem, imagine what 60,000 angels would do on behalf of the Lord Jesus. He could have done that. And of course, angels weren't even necessary. Simply the will of God the Son is enough to blot all humankind out of existence. At any moment, Jesus could have defended himself, but he didn't. He intimately knew each and every one of the soldiers who beat him and spit upon him and tortured him as God. He had formed him, formed them in the wombs of their mothers, yet Jesus did nothing to restrain any of them. Instead, he allowed them to pour out their hatred upon him. And even when it came to his trial, Jesus showed supernatural silence, because can anyone honestly believe that the Son of God could not out-argue or out-debate any priest or religious lawyer? He could have argued his freedom. Jesus was not stumped by the priests. He was not incapable of defending himself to Pilate or to Herod. Jesus could have silenced them all with the word, but he didn't open his mouth in defense. And so he died the death of a criminal. Absolutely. Because he was willing to do so. He was taken by evil men, but he wasn't taken with resistance. See, Jesus wasn't out of options when he died upon the cross. That was the option he chose. He made the choice to die in our place so that we might live. That takes us to the last section. It's the mission of the servant in verses 10 through 12. 
yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. See, this was all the plan of God. Men took Jesus and they abused him in horrific ways, but it didn't happen apart from the express sovereign will of God. The fullness of God's wrath had to come down upon sin, and that's what came down upon Jesus at the cross. Now, we need to take a moment to consider that. Just how bad is sin? How bad is it? What is it that our sin deserves? Our sin has to deserve the more, most horrific kind of death imaginable because Jesus died for it. And not just any way. He didn't drop dead. He died upon the cross. See, we tend to forget this. We take our sins for granted. It's, it's only a little lie. It's no big deal. I lost my temper. Everybody does. No biggie. Sure, I lusted again, but, you know, I can always ask for forgiveness. We do all that. But all of that, each and every single sin is a sin for which Jesus, God the Son, suffered and died. It was for that lust that Jesus had nails driven through his hands and his feet. It was for that grudge and that anger that Jesus hung on agony upon the cross. For all those things and much, much more. Every single sin was enough to bring down the full and utter wrath of God. And all of it, for all humanity at all time, fell upon the Son of God in a matter of hours. That sin had to be answered, and God had a plan to answer it. It was Jesus. God willed that his Son suffer and die in our place. And that's never something to take for granted. But because Jesus did suffer and die, what happened? Well, now we can be forgiven. Now the price has been paid. The assurance, again, the assurance is the resurrection. That's what we celebrate Sunday. But it's even hinted at here in Isaiah 53. I don't know if you saw that. Because how is it that the servant of God can see his seed? How is it that the servant of God can see his days prolonged if that servant has suffered, died, and been placed into a grave? At that point, it seems that all the opportunity for future seed or for future days is past. That's long gone. How is it that he should see it in the future? Well, there's only one option. That servant has to come out of the grave again. And that's what happened on Sunday morning. Because Jesus labored in death, we find satisfaction in resting in Christ. Because Jesus paid our debt, now we have been justified in the sight of God. Because Jesus makes intercession for us who were the transgressors, now we've been made the children of God, his seed. That's what we remember every Good Friday. That's what we remember every Resurrection Sunday. Hopefully that's what we remember every single day of the year. The salvation that God offers to us is free, but it came at the highest of cost. It came at the death of his son. Jesus had to be rejected. He had to become our substitute and die in this way in order to complete his mission to bring us into a right relationship with God. Hopefully, everybody in this room, you know God through Jesus Christ. You have this relationship, and for us... Every Good Friday, every Resurrection Sunday, that's an opportunity for us to be reminded of the things that Jesus did for us. It's an opportunity for us to express our gratitude to God. To God, This event right here, this week, this is the very cornerstone of our faith. Because if Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise from the grave, we have nothing. We have no hope. We have no relationship with God. We have no hope of any relationship with God. Zero. This is it. For others... Perhaps this season is just another religious holiday. You know, maybe you showed up because that's just what you do on Easter. It doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't. The Lord Jesus died for you on the cross, and his desire for you is that you would be saved. That you would know him in truth. That you would know him in the spirit, not, not just through some religion. Through things you just always do. So turn to him tonight, receive his salvation, turn away from your sins, because those were the things for which Jesus died. Those were the things for which he bore the wrath of God. Turn to Jesus in faith, believe him to be God who died and rose again.
place your trust in him as your God and be saved.